Good morning, Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome to those of you who have gotten in here on time. As you know, the other half of the congregation will be in once we start. That's usually how this works. Welcome if you are tuning in by cable or through the internet. Welcome to a morning of worship. It's one of those days, you know, it's a little rainy outside, but it's a good Sunday because tomorrow's not really a Monday because most of you have it off, but it's also a good day because we get to come and worship. So let's pause and invite God to be present and to reveal himself and to teach us this morning. Let's pray. Father God, there is so much on our minds. So many things that are distracting us, so many things that the enemy would like us to focus on, Father, but we really want to focus on you, for you call us into your very presence. You invite us through song, through scripture, through, through community, Father, to be transformed. So this morning, we just pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself in the music, in your word, in our interaction. And that in seeing you, we may each be transformed. We ask all this in the name of Jesus the Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Welcome to worship. Welcome, team. Welcome to you, Pastor Daryl, and to everybody here and those watching. We're here to worship today. Uh, Pastor Daryl is going to be sharing from Scripture a little bit later on the promises of God that never change. It, consistent from the Genesis to the Revelation account in Scripture. And something else that I have noticed um, without fail as consistent from the beginning of Scripture to the end is, is worship. Uh, is God created us to worship. He created us to be in that kind of a relationship with Him. And we see that from the beginning of the Bible to the very end. And we have the opportunity to worship. And we're not, we're not doing like so many people tried to desperately to, to reach up and, and, and grasp a hold of God. We are worshiping a God who reached down and grasped a hold of us by His grace. And whenever people started to um, lose sight of the worship of the true God, they would always find something else to worship. Friends, we are made to worship. So let us stand, let us gather our voices, let's gather our hearts into an atmosphere of worship. Okay, let's join our voices. Before the day, before the night. Oh 
I just kept thinking of another song that I wanted to sing along with that one. Could you sing this with me? Praise you. Praise you. Let my life praise you. so wonderful to be in God's presence. Amen? Before you take your seat, let us share God's presence with one another. Greet one another. Build up one another in love and in grace before you take your seat. Thank you, everyone. I want to share a song that I wrote. Charlotte and I and Kim and Sam are going to, going to do this. So, a song called I Will Sing to You. Uh, once we get through it a couple of times, Feel free to sing along. I know a couple of you here know it. Amy knows it, and uh, she's heard us do it before. So, yeah, feel free to sing along to get through a little bit of it. So. Awesome Lord. Mighty King, oh, my lips just want to sing of your mighty love, the love you gave to me. And your love has set me free, and I will lift your name on high. I will let my spirit fly into the heavenly up to where you are i will sing to you because i love you so i love you so and i know there's no greater love in me that a man Lay down his life for a friend, and I love you because you first loved me. I will speak of your name, for my life's forever changed, and I give the glory. To the one who knew me Even before I was born 
It's you, my Lord, it's you, my King, and my lips will always sing from the depths of the deepest part of me. I will sing to you because I love you so, and I know there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay And I love you because you first love me. Awesome Lord, mighty King, oh, my lips just want to sing of your mighty love, a love you gave to me. Jesus, your love has set me free, and I will lift your name on high. I will let my spirit fly into the heavenlies, up to where you are. I will sing to you, sing it with us. Because I love you so, I love you so, and I know there's no greater love than me. That a man would lay down his life for a friend, and I love you because you first loved. And I love you because you first loved me. And I love you because you first loved me. think since we did this service just like an hour and a half ago I'd remember the order Sam you'd be wrong but anyway hey we want to spend some time in prayer we um we received a whole bunch of prayer concerns from our prayer box at the mall so um we'll pray over those as well I have a, a bunch of blessings I want to share with you this morning and then we'll spend some time in prayer a um, little guy by the name of Broxton Schiffer, six years old. This is the grandson of Amy and Brad Smith. Um, little Broxton uh, struggles with autism, and he was not feeling well the other day, and the local folks couldn't figure out quite what was going on. Turns out, when they got him to Children's, he had to have an emergency appendectomy. But he is doing well. So thanking God for watching over Broxton. Uh, Brenda Cocaine got home the other day. Uh, that's good news. Uh, as did Rich Hart. He didn't get home last Sunday like we thought, but he got home this week. And Jim and Jane Allen are now settling into their new home in Clarion. So that's all good news. Um, my, uh, many people know that my stepmom, Pauline, was in the hospital and then was discharged from there to a um, long-term care hospice facility. And then on Thursday, out of the blue, they let Dad know that she was coming home. So she is back in her own home with hospice care. And that is also a blessing. 
And today we have among us a guy we've been praying for for weeks. So Dave McMullen is with us. So welcome back, Dave. It's good to see you, brother. All right. The primary kids survived the first week of school. College students have been in a couple weeks, and I haven't heard of any tragedies, so that's good. So we need to keep thanking God for them. And uh, let's spend a few moments just lifting up our hearts and asking God to, um, to connect with us. Let's pray. Father, it is so good to hear of folks um, getting better, returning home, um, walking with you as they struggle even through long-term disease. We thank you, Father, for your presence, for the way you watch over, for the way you care, for the way you show your love. Father, there are so many other situations that we're aware of that burden our heart this morning. And there are so many situations from folks that we don't even know. So we just pray that you would hear these concerns as we lift them up to you. Father, we're not telling you anything you don't already know. Thank you for being there. Thank you for being present. We pray, Lord, that folks would become more aware of your presence and in so doing, they would find hope and encouragement, wholeness, healing. Now, Father, as we prepare to open your word, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your word again that we may be transformed, that we may look and act more like Christ. Walk with us. Guide us this day. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. A new song for us today, and um, I'm going to invite you to sing where you can, but particularly on this reoccurring line of lyrics that says, I will stand on every promise of your word. If you come in on the word, stand on every promise of your word. It goes like this, stand on every promise of your word. Let's do it again. Stand on every promise of your word. Stand on every promise of your word. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. 
So I know the message was kind of subtle in this song, but did you get the theme of what we sang? I will stand on every promise of your word. Thanks for helping out. Appreciate it much. Thank you, team. Thanks, Sam. Morning again, church. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Corinthians, the, eight, the first chapter, verses 18 to 22. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to 22. Here's what God's Word says. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, as a pastor, I get to do a fair amount of reading. And one of the things that I read a lot of is... Is, is books that talk about how people deal with emotional struggles and emotional trauma. And it's always interesting because I, I'll read an author and I'll think, that, that's really interesting. I, I wonder if that's exactly how it works. You know, it's their idea. It, it's not that they're trying to deceive, but it's not always 100% like they think. I never have that problem when I get to this book. I never have to wonder, well, that's a really neat promise. I wonder if he means it. We began our time several weeks ago talking about the authority of the Word of God and how this should be the final word 
on who we are and how we live life. And then two weeks ago, we talked about how the Word of God is clear. Clear enough for anyone to get something out of it, especially because the Holy Spirit works within us to teach us, to mold us, to shape us, and to help us understand His Word. Then last week, we talked about the sufficiency of God's Word. How this is the complete Word of God. It's what we need for faith and life. We don't have to wait for an additional word. We we don't have to find somebody that has the answer. It's in here. And today we want to talk about God's promises and how we can trust them. God's promises appear early and often in his word. They appear from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. In Genesis 3, 15... Adam and Eve have just eaten of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, which they were told not to. God questions Adam first, questions Eve, and then he says to the serpent, and I will put enmity, I still can't say that word, it's a third time this morning. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, that's singular, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is a promise in the third chapter of Genesis that God will send someone born of Eve who will crush the enemy. That someone is Jesus Christ. Next to the last verse in all of Scripture, Revelation 22, verse 20, he, being Jesus, who testifies to these things, says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I'd be okay if he wants to do that this afternoon, this evening. I'm good. I mean, there's things I want to do in life. Don't get me wrong. I had a great day floating down the Allegheny on Friday on my day off with my wife. But I'm pretty sure anything he's got for me is going to be better even than that. So he can come anytime. So this text in in Genesis saying that that Christ is going to be sent, that, that, that God is going to send the Messiah, is the first of 38 prophecies or promises about the Messiah. Everything from where he'll be born to how he'll die to to being buried to being raised from the dead to to how he'll be beat to what he'll look like to where he'll be born. All of that is in the Old Testament. Let me remind you the, the most recent of the Old Testament books was written 400 years before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You get back to Genesis, it's way earlier than that. And 38 times God says, this is what's going to happen, and that's exactly what happens. It has all found its fulfillment in the person of Christ. Isn't that amazing? There are other promises in Scripture, and in every one we hear words like this about its trustworthiness. Joshua 23, 14 Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, Joshua says at the end of his life. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Joshua makes it clear that God is faithful in his promises. The psalmist says the same thing in Psalm 119, 140. Your promises have been thoroughly tested. And your servant loves them. Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. And faithful in all he does. The Old Testament makes it clear that God is a faithful God. We get to Romans. And in talking about Abraham, Paul says this. Yet he, Abraham, did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Do you remember what the promise was? Abraham's nearly 100 years old. His wife, Sarah, has never been able to have children. And she's way past childbearing years. And God says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your offspring are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. For Abraham, 
He figured if God says it, he'll figure out how to make it happen. You know what Sarah did? She laughed. So God said, well, then you're going to name that kid Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew. Can you imagine? He's 20, 30 years old. She calls again, Isaac. Oh, that's right. His name reminds me that I laughed when God said I was going to have him. What a wonderfully humorous name. Galatians 4.28 says, Now you brothers and sisters like Isaac are children of promise. We are just like Isaac. We are children of promise. We can hold on to that. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord's not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If you're like me, I get a bit impatient on occasion. I want what I want when I want it, usually how I want it too. But God says, you know what? You need to rest and just wait a minute. I, I've got more people I want in the kingdom. That's why I haven't come back yet. Boy, I wish he'd hurry. But we know that he will see it through. And lastly, from 1 John 2, 25. And this is what he promised us. Eternal life. Of all the promises in Scripture, this is most critical. We will have everlasting life with him. According to the Gospel of John and the high priestly prayer of Jesus, eternal life begins when we get to know God. That would be in this life and continues on forever. So why can we trust God's promises? Well, first of all, we need to talk about the character of God. God's character is that he is truth, that he does not change. And because he does not change, when he promises something, it happens. Remember, his word has power. His word is what created all that you see around you. The entire universe was created at the word of God. His character is such that when he speaks a promise, that promise will come to pass. So we can trust in these promises because of God's character. If you're anything like me, you have made promises to children, to spouse, to friends, to family, to others, and then circumstances change. And all of a sudden, your promise doesn't work out. That has never happened with God. When God makes a promise, it happens. That's his character. We also know that in the Old Testament, Joshua and others remind us that God's promises came true and will continue to come true. When you be, look at Scripture and you start in Genesis and you read through to Revelation, you see that the Old Testament is one long narrative of God saying, listen, here's my standard. By the way, you can't meet it. Your only hope is that I send a Messiah and I will do that. And they wait and they wait. And they wait for the fulfillment of that promise. We get to the New Testament, and it's pretty clear that Jesus is the answer to that fulfillment. He is the yes to all those promises. And then the New Testament writers remind us that God will continue to be faithful. If he sent his Messiah like he said, then he will forgive us. He will give us eternal life, just like he said. So let's go back to our text. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. All of them find their completion in Jesus Christ. God does, make, does not make promises that he does not intend to keep. That's why Peter can stand up on the day of Pentecost and with boldness say, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for, forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, you know, if you go to church regularly... If you try really hard at your Christian journey, if you give enough, if you do enough service, if you're kind to people, there's none of that. When we repent, when we believe, when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit comes within us and dwells within us so that we have God with us every day. And 1 John 2 reminds us, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven. That's past tense, folks 
have been forgiven on account of his name. You know, many of us have no problem believing that other people are forgiven, and we'd have no problem sharing this text with them and say, look, the word says you're forgiven. And yet many of us live as though our sins are not forgiven. Many of us have some memory in our past that the enemy keeps bringing up, and we believe that that action of ours makes us unacceptable. As though someplace there's a get-out-of-jail-free card for God in this clause that, 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 that exempts him from forgiving us, even though he forgives everybody else. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we all have favorite promises in Scripture. First, I would encourage you that you make sure that the promise you're holding on to is actually what Scripture says. I can't tell you how many people have told me that God promises that he will not give us more than we can handle. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says there's nothing going to come against you that you and I can't handle together. Look, I can't go to Walmart on a Friday night without God. Some of you have tried it. Because I'm prone to say things I shouldn't say to people who probably need to be told that stuff, but that's not my place. As somebody in my life says, I'm not sure those people have had any fetching up. They don't know how to be gracious or kind or patient or gentle. We all need God every day to get through anything in life. The scripture says there's nothing coming into your life that you and I can't handle together. So some of my favorites, Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives from the love of money, be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You see, God does not promise me a huge bank account, a gorgeous home, a wonderful family that is perfect, and no struggles. He just doesn't. Some of you know that by experience, don't you? You've walked through stuff. If it wasn't for God, you would not still be standing. What God does say is, whatever you come up against today, you don't have to journey through that alone. I'm right there. And I'll always be right there. I'm never going to be on holiday. I'm never going to be far away. I'm never going to forget you. I'm never going to be too busy. I'll always be right there. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians 1 is talking about. He gave us this deposit guaranteeing us what's going to come in the future. The other passage promise that I love is out of Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God is not waiting to split your hair with a lightning bolt. That's not his plan for you. His plan is that you and, and God work together to do the work he's called you to do. That may be in your career. That may be in a different career. That may be uh, in the home, raising children. God has a plan. And God will never leave us in the midst of that plan. But the most important promise that he's made is that he'll forgive us, that he'll give us his grace. Romans 8, 1 and 2 makes it clear, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Think about that. No matter what we've done, when we come to Christ and Christ forgives us for that sin, there is no condemnation. The enemy doesn't like that message. The enemy is going to try to condemn you every day, all day long. He's whispering in your ear about all the stuff you've done wrong. Tell him to go away. Remember, he's the father of lies, unlike God, who's the father of truth. So what's the reality if we have this promise of forgiveness? The reality is quite simple. You're forgiven. More importantly, you're God's child. Do you hear that? He promises forgiveness. He delivers forgiveness. There aren't any qualifiers. When we come to Christ, he forgives completely. 
So whatever it is in the back of your mind that the enemy has been needling you with to make you think you're unacceptable, that you're somehow the one weird person in the entire world that God can't forgive, tell him to take it and go someplace else. Because you are forgiven. You are his child. I love the promises of God. I get excited about them because I know that that even though my life has never been perfect, even though I have no control over the future, I know God's right there with me. And with that promise, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter who's in power in the government. It doesn't matter what the weather does. It doesn't matter what the price of gas becomes. God's got me in the palm of his hand. I'll be all right. Worst case scenario, I start eternal life on that side of the veil sooner. I'm okay with that. That's his promise. I've got you. Let's pray. Father God, help us to cut through the noise of the enemy and help us to accept your promises found in your word that you love us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. You have a plan for us, that you're eager to forgive us, that you have eternal life waiting for us. Lord, may those promises shape and mold, heal, and comfort us today, this week, every day in the future. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand as we sing a song that I trust will cause you to reflect more deeply on what you've heard today. May God's word continue to speak to us today. I'm finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, okay. the last thing I need is to be heard. Pour down 
Oh God, even when we do not have words to speak, we pray that you would hear our heart and that your spirit would speak for us. Lord, I lift up every individual that is just reflecting on you and calling upon you today. And I pray, God, that they will be okay in your presence and that you will reveal yourself to them in a way that they will be spoken to and that they will be changed. For all of us, oh God, we need you and we thank you for inviting us into this place today. Lord, now as we come to our concluding moments, we offer our hearts to you, for we do not want to leave this place the same. So we offer our hearts and ask, oh God, that you would receive us and that you would walk with us in a very experiential way in the days ahead. And Lord, we offer our thanks for your goodness. We offer our thanks for all that you have provided for us. And we now give you our gifts, our offerings. Lord, we offer ourselves and we offer our tithes to you. You are worthy of all that we have, for you have given that to us first. So use these gifts so that others may come to a place where they hear your voice and they latch on to your promises. Accept these gifts, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as the offering attendants wait upon us. As Kim plays and as the plates come by, if you have a prayer slip or a because you count form, Uh, Drop that in. Thank you for your ongoing support. If you're watching from some other church, thank you. We ask you to support your local church first. Thank you. Sing these words, glorify thy name and glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. been good to be together today. As Daryl comes up to give some uh, closing um, words of, um, of um, announcement and encouragement, I pray that um, you've had a good morning. And you know, the music, uh, we just love bringing music to you. I want to remind you, the choir is still open. Thanks to all that have responded to me over the last week. We are going to rehearse on this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. 
And our, our hope is that we will have enough voices that we can sing in the park next Sunday morning as we gather together for one, one worship setting next Sunday morning. So wouldn't it be nice to have a choir there as part of that celebration? Six o'clock Wednesday night. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So Sam has mentioned it, we're going to meet in the park next Sunday at 10.30, which means the 8.15 people get to sleep in and y'all have to get up earlier. Sorry. Um, 10.30 in the park, Sunday school, 9 to 10. There's a rumor that there will be donuts and coffee in the park to make your early rising that much easier. Don't be late. We won't have them at 10.45. I can almost guarantee it. All right. Um, Disciple Bible study, we're having two information sessions to see if you're interested in being a part of that long-term study. Um, this coming Tuesday, September 6th at 12.30, both of these are going to take place in Heritage Hall. So Tuesday the 6th at 12.30, and then the following Monday, a week from tomorrow, at 6.30 in the evening. Showing up doesn't mean you're committing to it. Showing up means you're going to look at the program and see if you want to be a part, all right? Um, the Widows Connection Group is going to begin their winter and fall session on Monday, September 12th at 10 a.m. in the Open Door Classroom. If you want to be a part of that, they meet the second and fourth Mondays. The children have a fall kickoff plan for the 17th of September. The Kids Zone and the Kingdom Bond Kids Club are going to get together for bowling and pizza at Buffalo Lanes. So if you want to have your kids a part of that, let Amy Smith know. And lastly, there's a women's event coming up on uh, September 25th called Aspire. It's out in the Hermitage area, correct? It's a three-hour evening event. Tickets are $20. Ann Bacher has tickets. Of course, she's not here today, but she will be next week. Be sure you let her know you want one of those tickets. She's already bought them, all right? Let's sing our way out. Let's stand. We've been using this song for the last several weeks good song to go out on. May the God's work be our light, our lamp. Together let's sing. Christ go with you. Amen.